Yeah. 
sing that song, I Am Redeemed. Let's stand. We're going to sing hymn number 423, The Solid Rock. Let's stand. Let's sing on that first verse. I'm praise the solid rock. It's built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest ring. Holy lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fades. Sunday, 515, Old Teen Room. Okay, so anybody who's helping, uh, signed up, or otherwise, if you're a member of the church and are planning on helping, please make sure you plan that. Uh, there is a meeting next Sunday. Also, do not forget the couples retreat is coming up, and I know we are filling up. Is that correct, Mr. Mohaney? So please, if you are planning on going, you need to do that now. I know October seems like a long way away, but you know they book up fast, and once the rooms are filled, they're filled, and then there's nothing more we can do. So please, if you are planning on coming, Please sign up and let the office know. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, that we can proclaim, I am redeemed. Christ liveth in us. And Lord, we're thankful that we can stand on the solid rock that is Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we give this offering to you, Lord, I pray that you would bless it, use it for your glory. Lord, that our offering to you is just a reflection of our love for you. And that, Lord, we would give with joyful, cheerful hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
starting in verse number one. <clears throat> in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, and one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, 
Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my tongue and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said, and then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand, uh, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy. <clears throat> Shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, until the houses without man and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. But yet, and it shall be a tent, and it shall return, and shall be eaten as a teal tree, and as an oak whose substance is in them. When they cast their leaves, so the, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for today, God. I thank you for tonight. I just pray that you would help me now as I preach this message. I pray you'd calm my nerves. I pray you'd fill me with the Holy Spirit, God. And I pray you just allow me to be used of you tonight, God. And I pray that each and every one of us here, myself included, would hear from you, God. That, that we would know that we met with you, God. And I pray I wouldn't get any praise, but you would get all the honor and praise, God. I pray that you would help us all to have open hearts. And open ears, God. And I pray you'd help me again as I preach it to say only what you would have me to say. And God, I pray that you just keep me uh, focused on the message that you have for us. And God, I thank you for all you do for us. I thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So in the first part of this chapter, it says the year that King Uzziah died. You know, you may think that's a, a historical thing, which it is. It's a historical fact. And if you go back to, you know, the book of Kings and the book of Chronicles, you can read about King Uzziah. And just some brief history for you. He ruled for 52 years, and he was noted as a good king. A lot of the Old Testament, you'll see, and this king was, he did that which was right, or this king was a bad king. You kind of almost, you know, just kind of uh, uh, separate them that way. This king was good, and this king was bad. But uh, we see here that Uzziah was noted as a, get, a good king, but he, his life ended tragically. He died because he went into the temple, and he, he wasn't supposed to, and God struck him with leprosy. In the end, he died. And Isaiah would have been alive for all of or, or most of his life. But King Uzziah he would have been the prophet under Uzziah. And he would have, uh, I don't know if he knew him personally, but he would have understood that he was a good king. And when Uzziah died, it brought Isaiah to a point. Now we know God inspired the book, but God brought Isaiah to where he noted it down that this was the year that King Uzziah died. And I believe that, you know, Isaiah was, you know, probably upset about this. It probably wouldn't have been a good king that he would have, you know, enjoyed being king, would have allowed him to prophesy and, and do his work as a prophet to the point where he wrote it down. And he said, King Uzziah died this year. And I believe that, you know, God gave Isaiah this vision, this vision of God on his throne, that God was you know, in his throne room, and we're going to talk a lot about that today, this glorious vision, is the fact that Uzziah died, he's no longer on his throne, but God told Isaiah, I am still on the throne. Amen. And I love that, we hear, you know, Pastor says that a lot, and it's great that, you know, God is still on the throne, but what does that really mean? You know, there is a literal throne in heaven, we know that from the book of Revelation, we know, you know, here Isaiah saw a vision, I know in uh, I wrote it down here in first, I think it's first Kings, Micaiah also saw God's throne when he was prophesying and many uh, other prophets in the Bible, we don't have time to go through all of them, saw God's throne room and they saw God on his throne. You know, you never once in the Bible does it go to the throne room of God and there's a man sitting there. Or you go to the throne room of God and there's an angel just, you know, taking God's place for today. No, God is always there. Why? Because God is always on the throne. And it's not just the throne of you know heaven, but he's on the throne, meaning he is overall of the earth. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And I know in, in verse 5 it says again, For mine eyes have seen the king. Isaiah would have seen God in this glorious vision, this glorious throne room. And it, you know it, we're going to talk a lot about what that meant to him. But he saw the king. I almost entitled the message, I saw the Lord. Because it really is, it was a life-changing experience for Isaiah that this king is taken down off his throne and God showed him, hey, Isaiah, I am always 
on the throne when he saw the Lord. So it was a very, you know, a, a, a changing experience in his life. John saw God's throne in Revelation chapter 4. The throne represents power and authority. You know, in the, the medieval times, or even now, you'll see kings and maybe presidents have this grand chair and this grand room where they sit and they rule and reign. Well, that would have symbolized their power. You know, they don't give that throne to just anybody. They don't let just anybody sit there. So those who are on the throne are those who have the power. We know that that's why here uh, God is always on the throne because God is always superior. A uh, throne represents power and authority. And God is always on the throne. Uzziah may, be, may have been off the throne, but God is never off of his, his throne. So today we're going to talk, uh, tonight, we're going to talk about what that means for us as a Christian. If, you know, this vision, a lot of times you'll hear this passage and it'll be preached maybe at a missions conference. And they, you know, we're going to talk about that wonderful verse, here am I, send me. And it was a call, it really called out to Isaiah to go and serve him. But we're going to talk about the whole chapter, that he saw the Lord, that he literally saw God's throne. He saw the vision there and what that meant. For him. So number one here is it invites him to worship. You know, I think it's amazing that here that, you know, what Isaiah did, what he, or what he saw, first he noted it down as he saw God high and lifted up. You know, a lot of today in our day and age, they want to bring God down to our level. Or, you know, even in our human mind, we try to think of God as, you know, in our own way. But God is so much higher and so much, you know, there's a word that we use. It's called transcendent. It means he's above us in a different category. You may not fully understand God because God is higher and holier and better than we are. And that's a great, wonderful thing because he's the one who sits on the throne. You know, wouldn't it be, it's wonderful that we can say to ourselves that somebody who is higher and smarter and wiser than me is the one who's ruling over everything. So it invites us to worship. So God is always on the throne, invites us to worship. And uh, number one here is his majesty. You know, when he saw the throne, his, it was magnificent. It was high, it was lifted up, it was beautiful. You know, it's not something that you would look at, uh, you know, be disgusted in. It's something that you would look at and be in awe. I know in the Bible, I forget where, but it says they stood in awe of God. You know, it, it would be good for us as a Christian to get to a point where we stand in awe of God. How amazing God is. How magnificent heaven is. How magnificent his throne room is truly is. Because if you lose sight of that, it's like, oh yeah, I pray to God. No, you pray to God of heaven who sits on the throne of the universe. And that is an amazing thing that we get to do every day because it's magnificent. And right here, you know, Isaiah, like I said, he, uh, Uzziah died. He may have lost track of how amazing the God that he gets to prophesy for really is. So it's magnificent and letter B is he's holy. So if you look at verse 3, and one cried unto another and said, holy Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The idea of holy is separated, without spot, without blemish, perfect in all that he is. And that's who our God is. He is holy. And what's amazing about that is God has called us to be holy. He says, be holy as I am holy. And that may seem impossible, and it is. We're not perfect. We're never going to be as holy as Christ until we, you know, we have our glorified bodies in heaven. But as here on this earth, if something may seem unholy or corrupt, that's something we need to stay away from. So the Bible says to be holy as he is holy. So his, his throne room was holy. It was magnificent. It says there, some people say holy, holy, holy. It was alluding to the Trinity, which very well could be. Uh, and then letter C here is glorious. So it was magnificent. It was holy. And it was glorious. Uh, if you read in verse uh, 4 here in the post. Uh, sorry, verse 3. Uh, we read verse 3. Verse 4 says, The post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried and the house was filled with smoke, it was a glorious, uh, wonderful thing. There, you know, God is more glorious than you could ever imagine. So today, I just, you know, tonight, I just want to bring this to your thought, you know, to your mind, is just how glorious and wonderful God really is. You never want to, you know, forget or just, you know, think, okay, well, yes, God is wonderful. I know that, and yes, I've experienced God in God's presence. And you know, Isaiah was a prophet of God that God had to send him this vision to remind him how amazing and how glorious. God really is. And it really what it comes down to is Isaiah got into God's presence. I don't know if you've ever, you know, think of God's glory and God filling the place with his glory and God, you know, entering into the praises of people, uh, you know, can go along with that is God's presence. You know, you can experience God's presence here in this church. And I'm sure you have maybe a song or a sermon or a, a special music and you felt God. Speaking to you, and you felt God was here with you. you know, some people call it, you, know, you have the goosebumps, the Holy Spirit goosebumps, and you know God is there. And it's a wonderful experience. That is what Isaiah would have been experienced here. But you know, you can experience that, you know, any time of the day. You can, God is always available to you. He's sitting on His throne, 
uh, waiting and ready for you to experience it. So that's God's presence. And we are going, and then thinking about that, all that to say, um, just kind of, uh, I didn't really know how to put all of it together, but God you know, told me to put it this way. So that's how I did it. It says that you are going to stand before God one day. You know, think about that. Isaiah would have saw God's throne room. Isaiah would have saw God sitting there, and it was encouraging to him. But sometimes I think to myself, you know, we are going to see God one day. And there's two different judgments. We know there's the great white throne judgment, which is for unbelievers. And God's going to judge them for what they've done. He's going to pour out their wrath and if they're because you know, they're not saved. And he's going to condemn them to hell. And unfortunately, that is the great white throne judgment. We're trying to tell as many people as we can to get them away from that. But then there's the judgment seat of Christ, where we, if you're saved, as believers, are going to stand before God. And... It came, you know, God brought this to my mind that, you know, Isaiah saw God, he was in God's presence, and he stood before God, but one day that's going to be me. One day that's going to be you, and you're going to give an account, and God's going to reward you for what you've done as a Christian, but you have to give it a, you know, you're going to have a judgment seat of Christ. I know in college they would tell us all the time in chapel and Bible classes, you know, they would tell us, I want you to have a good judgment seat of Christ. Because if you really think about it, your life is, you know, but right now, if you're saved, is telling other people, ministering to other people, and doing exactly what God wants you to do, and you're going to be rewarded for that at your judgment seat of Christ. So if you have a good judgment seat, if you hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, then you've lived the life that God wants you to live. And isn't that what we all want? That's what we're all striving to do. You know, it's not just, I'm um, saved, and now I get to go to heaven, which is great. But God left you here for a purpose. He didn't just save you and take you right to heaven. So we're striving to have a good judgment seat of Christ. So it brings us to a point of worship. And then the last one here is that he's worthy. You know, never lose sight of the fact that God is worthy of your worship. Nobody else is. I mean, think about that. Not one human, not one athlete, one you know politician is worthy of your worship except for God. God is the creator. He created everything you see. He created everything that you smell and, you know, wonderfully taste or whatever it may be. God created all of that. But he's also the redeemer. He saved you from your sin. Nobody else saved you from your sin. Only Amen. Jesus died for you. Only God, the Father, sent Jesus to die for you. And only the Holy Spirit indwells you once you're saved. And all of that is because of what God has done for you. God is worthy of worship because he's the creator. Because he's the redeemer. And then lastly, because he's the king of kings. Isaiah said, I saw the king. You know, I bet you he told people about that for days. That wonderful vision when he saw God high and lifted up. He was probably running and telling everybody. Kind of like when you first got saved and you wanted to tell everybody about it. Why? Because you saw the king. You met with the king and he saved you. Never forget that. That ought to bring you to a place of worship where you're glorifying God. You know, praising God, worshiping God. Uh, how I, you know, we've described it in our Bible class really is that it's a redeemed person giving worth to God for what he's done for them. And if you don't, you know, if you don't think about it, if you don't ponder it, if you don't realize how you know, wonderful God is and all that he's done for you, you're not going to worship him. So it invites you to worship when you see this, uh, you know, this vision that Isaiah had. And then second here, it demands commitment. It demands commitment. We're going to read verse 5 here in chapter 6. It says, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And then letter A here is a proper perspective. A proper perspective. You know, I've always loved this verse. It, it honestly has changed my life more times than I can count. Is because he saw God high and lifted up. He saw God for who he really is. The glorious, holy, magnificent creator, redeemer. All that we just talked about. Then, so don't miss that. In verse 5 it says, Then said I, woe is me. Once he saw God for who he really is, he realized who he really was. He was a wretched Wicked sinner. If you get to a point in your life that you you know you meet with God and you see God for who He really is, it'll bring you to a place that says, "Wow, I need God to cleanse me. I need to be holy. I need to be more righteous." Why? Because when you get into God's presence, when you meet with God, you realize, "Wow, I need to meet. You know, I need to uh, be more like Him," as Jesus has said before. So uh, I've heard this quote before. I think it was uh, Pat, uh, uh, Jim Binney. I don't remember, but he said, "You know, nobody gets into God's presence and says, man, I just love myself.'" 
No, he realizes that when you get into God's presence, like, man, I need to be, you know, more righteous. I need to get clean, like I said before. Why? Because that's when you realize who God really is, you realize who you really are. So it, that may be something that we need to do tonight or, you know, before you go to bed, when you pray or have devotion tomorrow, is, you know, get a new vision or, or get a correct view of God to see God for who he really is and realize, hey, there's some things in my life that need to change. I, uh, as Isaiah said, woe is me. For I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips. You know, he was very personal about it. He didn't say, he didn't say man, you know, every, he does say I'm in the midst of a people of unclean lips. But before that, he says, I am a man of unclean lips. You know, take ownership for your own sin. You know, I, you know a lot of times in the school, uh, you, know, I, you know, I teach fifth grade, and you know, some of the younger kids, even the older kids, obviously. But they'll get in trouble, and you know they did something, and then you confront them. They're like, oh, well, this person did this. Most of the time, that's the person they say, oh, well, this person did this, and this person did that. No, you know, take ownership. He said, I am a man of unclean lips. You know, if we're all honest with ourselves, we are a people of unclean lips, and we need God to help us and God to cleanse us. So he was very personal. When he saw God for who he really is, he saw himself for who he really was. So he had the right perspective. He had, he had this perspective change. So how do you view God? You know, that's kind of a deep question. It's very important is how do you you God. How you view God will change your life. If you view God as just somebody who's, you know, as people say, the man upstairs, and I know this is a Sunday night crowd, and we know who God is, and most of us, probably all of us, have met with God and are saved and have devotions each and every day, and we pray out to God, but, you know, the, we have to still always realize that our view of God is so important, that He's a loving God, and, but He's also, you know, a radical God who expects us to be holy. It's a God who doesn't put up with sin. It doesn't not one time does it say that sin is okay because you know I understand that. No, he's, he said the thing that J David did displeased the Lord. God hates sin. And when you have the right view of God and you have the right view of yourself, that's when your relationship with God is what it needs to be. Right. We are nothing and God is everything. And uh, turn with me to Galatians chapter 6. Uh, Paul reiterated this point for us. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 3. For it says that for if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. And you know, that verse is always encouraging to me that the Bible says that, hey, you're nothing. But I realize who wrote that. You know, Paul started many churches, wrote a lot of the New Testament. And he, of all people, said, man, I was all the way over here in sin, persecuting Christians, persecuting the church. And God saved me. And now I'm out here serving him. And look at all that I've done. He's like, man, I travel the world. And I don't have a car or a plane. No, he's traveling all over, starting churches. And he could have said, if he was prideful, said, man, I've done a lot. But no, he said, I remember what God did for me. And God is everything, and I am nothing. And that goes right back to having the right view of God and the right view of yourself, is that we are nothing except for the grace of God. And we can do nothing except for the power of the Holy Spirit, because all that we do is God leading us and directing us. And that's when we get in trouble when we think, man, I did something good or, you know, that song was pretty good or, you know, that I witnessed to that person. And I came up with a lot of good arguments for what they were saying. No, God is everything and we are nothing. So have the right view of God. Have the right view of yourself. So a proper perspective. But then second here is a purposeful pursuing. You know, Isaiah was committed to God after he had this vision. He was committed to God. There was a purposeful pursuing. You know, how committed are you to God? You know, I think about people nowadays get committed to just about everything. You know, you're committed to you know, your sports team. And, you know, I'm a 76ers fan, and I'm less committed now than I was a few weeks ago. But why? Because, you know, they lost. But, you know, I was so committed to them, I made sure I watched the games. I got YouTube TV so I could record them, and I can watch it whenever I need to. Why? Because I was committed to that team. But, you know, a lot of people are committed to different things. I think of our, maybe you've done it before, it's called HelloFresh. It's wonderful. It's a meal plan they get you because before you even try to cancel it, they send you more meals. But, I, I mean, I enjoy it. But I'm committed to it. Why? You know, you're committed to different subscriptions that you have. And we're committed to it. They lock you in. They try to get all your money out of you. But, you know, are you committed to God? I thought of this as random. But, you know, if God was like a monthly subscription, would we even subscribe to it? You know, are we committed to God? God is so much more than that. But unfortunately, he gets less of our time sometimes, less of our energy, less of our you know, desires. You know, we wake up and we look at the phone before we look at the Bible. You know, are we committed, I mean, full-heartedly to God? What are you committed to right now that is blocking 
your commitment to God. Because I guarantee after Isaiah had that vision, nothing else mattered. He's like, man, I just saw God high and lifted up, and his commitment is on fire, and he's ready to tell everybody. I mean, we'll get to it in a little bit, but he literally said, hear my Lord, send me. He wasn't saying, man, God, I want to, but I got this thing going on next week, and I really can't. No, he was committed full-heartedly to God till nothing else matters except for what God wanted him to do. And that's what we need to be as Christians in this day, especially in this day and age. As the Bible says, as you see the day approaching, be committed to church. Be committed to your prayer and your Bible reading. And mostly, really, be committed to seeing other people saved. You know, there are very trying times and a lot of people are hurting, but a lot of people are really looking for an answer. And we have the answer, so be committed to telling other people. Be committed to praying for your family members that aren't saved. You know, maybe there's some commitments that you have in the past that's kind of fallen off, you know. Tonight is the night to recommit those things to the Lord. And, you know, it all started with Isaiah seeing the Lord for who he really is. High and lifted up. He said, man, God is high and lifted up. I am undone. And he got committed to the Lord. So, be, you know, have a purposeful pursuit. And what are you committed to? You know, it's not just being committed to church, but committed to God. You know, whatever God wants you to do, whether he wants to serve in a ministry, or maybe he just asks you to, to witness to somebody, or hand a tract to somebody in a, in a McDonald's line, and whatever it may be. That may just be me. I love McDonald's. A Dunkin' Donuts line, he asks you to a hand a tract to somebody. You know, God wants you to do those things, and if you're committed to him, you'll do anything you ask. You know, I'm committed to my wife. And if she says, Anthony, I need you to take out this trash. It's got a lot of, you know, disgusting diapers in it. You know, I'm going to do it, because I'm committed to her. Now, she'll tell you I don't do it all the time, but I try to. But why? if God asks you to do something and you're committed to him, you won't even think twice about it. You say, well, God loves me and I love God. I'm committed to him, so I'm going to do as he asks. So get committed to God. And if you're not, you know, it may help you to see God for who he really is and that he's worthy of your commitment. He's worthy of your praise. So be committed to God. It's a purposeful pursuing. How committed you? How committed are you to God right now? I mean, if really, I mean, let's think about it literally. If you had to, you know. Scale yourself from 1 to 10. How committed you are to God? Are you a 10? Because if you're not, you should be. Now, I'm not saying I am. I'm just saying that's what God deserves and that's what God requires. He said to forsake all and follow me. He didn't say, no, I'm interested in some half committed followers. No, he's not interested in that at all. He wants full hearted, committed followers of Jesus Christ. So be committed to God. It demands commitment. And then lastly here, it requires action. Uh, going back to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse uh, 5, you know, he says, Woe is me, for I am undone. And what does he do about it? In verse 6, he says, Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, and having a live coal in his hand, which he has taken with the tongs off the altar, and he set it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched my lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Excuse me. And he says, Who will go for us? And then said, Here am I. Send me. So it required some action. He didn't just get committed, get excited about God. You know, this is great. And the next day, uh, you know what, I'll do it tomorrow. I, I mean, not that I, you know, approve anything that, you know, Nike does or says, and I certainly don't buy their overpriced shoes. But I, I remember this one commercial. It always says, yesterday, you said tomorrow. And obviously, they're talking about exercise and working out. But that was pretty applicable for us as a Christian. You know, uh, yesterday, you said you would read your Bible tomorrow, and here's tomorrow. Or yesterday, you said you'd pray more. Or yesterday, you said you, you know, could be committed to God. So don't make it a, you know, something you said yesterday or something you might do. You know, stay committed. It requires action. Isaiah said, here am I. Send me. And the Lord is really looking for somebody to go for him. And the Lord is looking for somebody to do his will. The Lord is looking for somebody to witness to, you know, be a sold out Christian, to be a committed Christian. You know, are you going to answer that call? So number one here is answer the call. You know, a lot of people, you know, they talk about the call of God and everybody gets a little nervous. They're like, oh, don't send me somewhere I don't want to go. You know, God's not going to do that. God is going, you know, if you delight in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. So if you're in tune with God, what you want is going to be what God wants. But you have to answer the call. Every one of us, if you are saved, has a call or has a plan or has a, you know, a, a calling on your life. It was very specific for Isaiah, well, you know, it wasn't just a general, you know, if you want to go, you can, or call it out to everybody, go to this general uh, region. No, it was specific, and realize that, that God has a specific plan for your life, and that's a wonderful thing, that the God of the universe would take time and plan a life for me, you know, and those crazies that sometimes I don't even follow it, you know, and if we're honest, you don't even follow it all the time, but God has a specific calling for us that we need to be committed to, so it requires action and we need to answer the call 
Are you willing to do whatever God has for you? Are you willing to do whatever God has for you? I see that here in Isaiah. He says, here am I, send me. He didn't say, here am I, send me, except unless it's over here. Or, here am I, send me, unless it's to that neighbor that doesn't like me. I'm not witnessing to that person. No, he said, here am I, send me. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And when you're fully committed to God, you'll do whatever he asks you to do. I think of, you know, I coach basketball, and I love coaching basketball. And your favorite players to coach are those who will listen to you, those who will do whatever you want them to do. I remember um, nothing against, you know, the boys. I love coaching the boys, and they're fun. But I remember one year I coached the girls' basketball team, and some of them were very new. And it was wonderful because they just thought I knew everything, and they did everything I asked. And, you know, we won quite a bit of games. But what? They were committed to learning basketball. They were committed to doing what Pastor Anthony said, and it was a wonderful time. It was great. But those are the Christians that God wants, or those who don't second-guess him or don't argue with him and just do whatever he says to do. Because they're committed to it. So are you willing to do whatever God has for you? And then letter B here, I see that there's a similar command. If you look in verse 9, it says, And he said, Go and tell his people, or this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. You know, and that may sound very similar to you. If you look in Matthew chapter uh, 28, so number one there is he says to go. He says to go and tell. He's telling Isaiah, go and tell you know, all the people about me what you've seen in the visions. And he was a prophet of the Lord, so that would have been a, a usual thing for him to do. But if you look at Matthew chapter 28, you know, God's message really hasn't changed to us today. In Matthew 28 and verse 19, if I can get there, it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the so in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So God's command for you today is to go and to tell. You know, that is our number one job as a Christian. A lot of people, you know, they'll say, keep the main thing, the main thing. What's the main thing? It's soul winning and telling other people about Christ and lifting up believers to do the same thing. So it's a similar command that God gave Isaiah that he gives us today. You know, we have a job to do. I mean, think about that. It is nobody else's job in the whole world to witness to unsaved people except for yours, except for Christians, except for the, those who have been redeemed, those who have seen God work, those who have experienced the love of God. And who better to tell other people than somebody who's experienced the same thing? You know, hey, you know, God loves you, and I can tell you why, because he loves me, and I've experienced it in my own life. So you have a job to do, and I have a job to do. It's not just Pastor Weigel or Pastor Dewana. We all have a job. To witness to other people. There are people in your life that I'll never talk to. There are people in your life that will never listen to me. Family members especially that may listen to you. Or, or you know, you say, oh no, they won't listen to me. Well, you make sure you're praying for them. That God will soften their heart. But you have a job to do. And that's to witness to people. We all have a job to do. And that's to witness to people. We are to be a witness to this lost world. And we need to, you know, connect with people. It's not just, okay, you need... Jesus, and, and you're not saved, and you need to be saved, and that's it. No, it's okay to talk to them, and be nice to them, and connect with them. A lot of times, people, especially people that you work with, you know, you know, talking to them, asking how they're doing, things of that nature, doing nice things for them, like, hey, uh, I'm backed up, can you help me out? You know, I think of when my old job, when I worked on an assembly line, I would get ahead, and then I would go and help somebody else. You know, it just shows a good Christian attitude, a good Christian worker, connecting with people, and that may help you bring them to salvation. You know, we, so we are to see the law saved and we are to help other Christians. You know, if you see another Christian who's down, it is also, it's not just your job to, you know, witness to people, but it's your job to lift up other people who are fallen, lift up other brethren who may need you. You say, hey, I haven't seen this person well. You know, give them a call or, hey, I know I realize this person seemed a little down today. You know, go alongside them. Hey, is there anything I can pray for you about? Most of the time, I found out if you ask somebody, can I pray for you about something, usually they'll give you something. If you ask me, how can you pray about me for something? I'll probably give you something because everybody likes their problems prayed for. So reach out to other people and be a help to them. So it's a similar command. You know, God is telling Isaiah and God is telling us to go and tell other people. So going back to Isaiah chapter 6 and verse uh, 11, it says, Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant and the houses without man and to the utterly desolate. So pretty much he's saying until there's nobody left to tell, that is when you can stop. I think of Peter when he says, how many times do I have to forgive these people? He goes, uh, Jesus said 70 times 7. He's not saying count to 490 and then stop. He's saying, you know, endless. Just keep forgiving. Just keep telling other people about Jesus. Yes, 
Somebody's going to reject you. Somebody may be rude to you. I know a lot of times when you don't knock on doors in Tom's River, you'll have a lot of rude people who you know slam the door in your face or no thank you. And I'm like, man, I'm just trying to be nice and tell you about the Lord. But you know, a lot of people, I would say it's about 50-50. Some people are very nice and they want to talk to you. And especially some of the younger people or the younger crowd that, you know, they're, they're very curious. I talked to a few uh, like college level kids. I remember one, his name was uh, Rocky. Or Rocco. It's difficult to forget that. But anyway, he was just so curious. He's like, man, I don't even understand any of that. You know, you know, is God real? And he was just asking very deep questions. Why? Because, you know, some people really are looking for God. And, you know, I found that's a great way to pray. Is God, bring me to somebody who's looking for you. Give me a divine appointment today, this week, to reach somebody who's looking for you. And God will answer that. You know, God loves to answer prayers, especially prayers that are in line with his will. And it's always God's will for you to witness to somebody. So pray and ask God to give you opportunities. And then pray and ask God for the courage, for the bravery to talk to that person. So uh, he said, how long? He said, keep witnessing. Never stop. Why? Because it's a continual response. You know, it requires, uh, the point here is it requires action. Uh, number two, that, yeah, you can just go to sleep. Sorry, I'm all over the place. It was a continued Response. So it never stops. It never says, all right, you witnessed to 10 people this week. You handed out 10 tracks, which is great. I used to do that. It's a good way to, you know, get yourself going and say, okay, I have these five tracks. I'm going to hand them out this week. And, you know, maybe you want to hand out six or seven, but have a stack with you and always be handing them out or always be trying to witness to somebody or always praying for that opportunity. You know, the Bible says, I think it's Colossians, that you may have a door of utterance. Just give me that opportunity to witness to somebody. And that never stops. As long as you're a Christian, that is your job to witness to people. And say, oh, well, I'm not very good at talking or I'm a little bit introverted. That's okay. God will give you somebody to talk to that you can connect with or that you can relate to. So ask God to help you with that. It's a continued response. So this is Isaiah's vision. You know, he, he saw God high and lifted up. He, and it changed who he was because he saw God for who he really was. So he invited him to worship. He saw how majestic and holy and wonderful God was. And he worshiped God. And, you know, that's really where it starts with you having a heart to worship God. Remembering what he's done for you. Remembering how good he is to you. And then it brought him to a commitment. Once you see how amazing God is, once you see how worthy God is, you're going to be committed to Him. Just like you're committed to a cause or committed to whatever it may be, you need to be committed to God. So if you're not committed to God or you're not as committed to God, remember we said if you're not a 10, if you're not fully sold out to God, that's what God is looking for. Tonight you need to get back and get committed to God. And then lastly here, it, was, it, it required a response. You know, Christian life is not just a life of just saying a few things, uh, singing a few songs, saying a few prayers. No, the Christian life is a life of action. It's a life of going out and reaching out to people. It's a life of doing things for other people. It's a life of you know, you know, going out and worshiping God and things of that nature. Why? It's not just a, a, a mundane, you know, I'm just going to be comfortable and satisfied with where I'm at. No, it's a life that requires action. So God changed Isaiah's life with these words. He encouraged him. He said, you know, this king is fallen off the throne, King Uzziah, but I am never off of the throne. And that's what really this is about, is that God is still on the throne. Yes, there's you know craziness going in this world, but I, I'm sorry to tell you, it's probably going to get crazier. The Bible says it's going to get worse and worse. And God is still on the throne through all of it, so we need to still worship Him. We need to still be committed, and we need to you know be required to go to some action. So this should drive us to worship. It should drive us to commitment. It should lead us to action. If you truly believe God is on the throne and he is in control of everything, it will change your life. As Isaiah, you know, you didn't have to convince Isaiah that God was on the throne. He saw God. And you may not physically see God on the throne, but you can know as a Christian that he is on the throne. As you, you believe God, that's what it's all about. It's believing, having faith in God. Even though you can't see God physically on the throne, but you can believe that he is knowing of, uh, you know, all the evidence that you see in your own life and experience in your own life. And you need to go and tell other people about it. Let's pray. God, I thank you for all that you've done for us. and God, I thank you that you are on the throne. God, I thank you that you really are overall, God, and that you're the ruler and you're superior and you're the authority in each and every one of our lives, God, and you'll never stop being that. You'll never stop being on the throne. We thank you for that, God. I pray you just bring us to a place of worship where we just adore and, and praise you for all that you are, God, that we would be committed that we would be sold out for you, God, and that would bring us to action, that we would witness to others, God, that we would just joyfully be involved in other people's lives, God, and strive to help them, whether they're saved or unsaved, God, that we would minister to them. God, I pray you'd help me to do all that in my own life and 
God, I pray you'd help me to be more committed to your cause, God, and do all that I can for you. And God, I pray myself included in all that's here, if there's, there's anything in our lives, God, that we're committed to that is just taking too much of our time, or, or maybe there's some things in our life that need to, that are just blocking our commitment to you, God, I pray tonight that we would, we would get those things out of the way, that we would confess them, God, and God, I pray tonight if there's someone on our heart that we need to witness to, or may we just need to be a better witness, God, that we would do that, and we pray and ask you to help us with that tonight, God. Thank you for all that you do for us, and thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can all stand. We're going to uh, close with a closing hymn. Let's stand. Hymn number 542. Lord, I'm coming home. If the Lord has placed something on your heart, the altar's open. Um, Lord, you know, if you... Like the pastor said, if there's someone that God has placed on your heart you want to witness to, pray that you ask the Lord to give you those opportunities and the words to speak. 542, Lord, I'm coming home. not to be filled with pride, Lord, but to be humbled before you, surrendered fully to your will and your leading. And Lord, we do pray for those opportunities this week, Lord, that you would empower us, give us those opportunities, Lord, and as those opportunities present themselves, Lord, just pray that we would, uh, Lord, just take, the, take those chances, take those opportunities, Lord, to, to be a witness, to tell someone about the saving grace and the Savior who died and loved them. Lord, I just pray that you would continue to use us. Lord, we thank you for what you've done in our hearts today. I pray, Lord, that as we leave here today, Lord, that the things we've heard, and, and Lord, how you perked and stirred our hearts, Lord, that, Lord, it would be something that we take with us, Lord, apply to our lives each and every day. Dismiss us now with your blessing. Give us safety as we travel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.